I'm Maurice Hirsch here today on the 76th day of Israel's war against the terrorists in Gaza. Um, the war is continuing on uh, um, with full force, with Israeli forces operating both in the north of Gaza and in the south of Gaza. Um, we are seeing uh, um, not a small amount of resistance and unfortunately not a small amount of soldiers, of Israeli soldiers being uh, uh, killed as well. Um, just today, we had a reminder of the capabilities of the terrorists with a massive uh, uh, barrage of rockets being fired, over 30 rockets being fired towards the center of Israel, towards Israel's mass of civilian population. Um, obviously, another one of the war crimes committed by these terrorists indiscriminately targeting Israel's uh, civilian population. In Judea and Samaria, we have seen also the, in, uh, the, the fight against the terrorists continuing on with many terrorists they're being arrested and some being killed in gun battles uh, with IDF forces as well. In the north, we've seen the continuation of the war of attrition being carried out by another one of the Iranian proxies, by Hezbollah, with the firing of rockets and anti-tank missiles. And today, uh, civilians also being injured in one of those attacks and then IDF uh, uh, forces responding there. I call it a war of attrition. It's really a full-on war because... There has already been that armed attack carried out by the terrorists and Israel is responding. But at the moment, both sides are trying to keep this war on a relatively low level, um, if you can call it that, when there are uh, um, already a number of Israeli uh, uh, fatalities and not a small amount of uh, fatalities of the terrorists uh, um, in Lebanon and Hezbollah as well. Um, further off, we're seeing also, obviously, that event with the Houthis, another Israeli proxy interrupting all of uh, um, the uh, freedom of passage and freedom of, and, and, and freedom of navigation via Bab el Manda, via, via the Straits of Tehran, um, and that whole access to Israel uh, um, through our southern corridor, through Eilat and through the Red Sea. That's an ongoing situation where, as we've uh, reported, there is a growing and mounting coalition of international forces um, now gathering in order to a deal with that threat and some reports already of some of the activities being carried out there um, by those coalition forces. That's where we're standing at the moment. We're talking about really a war on three different fronts, Gaza uh, uh, and Judea and Samaria on the one hand, um, Hezbollah and Lebanon on the other, and then Iran and obviously the Houthis on that third level constantly uh, playing into that threat. Um, what we've seen uh, um, also is not a small amount of uh, uh, of, of, of media warfare. And that's uh, uh, um, really what we're going to be uh, discussing today um, with uh, um, with our special guest. With our special guest, um, we're talking, uh, um, we're pleased and, uh, and proud to uh, to have uh, with us today, uh, Gil Hoffman. Uh, Gil Hoffman is the, the executive direct, director of, uh, um, of Honest Reporting and for many years, the chief political correspondent for the Jerusalem uh, uh, Post. Um, Gil, thank you for joining us. Um, really, what we'd like to discuss with you is the, is, is, is the media, how the media plays into this whole war from propaganda and media twist, uh, media diversion, media subversion, even if we could call it, and, and, and really what should be happening. Um, we've seen some uh, um, uh, credit where credit's due, some not uh, small successes um, by honest reporting, managing to persuade major media centers um, to correct, to amend um, previously erroneous reports. Um, and that's part of the, the this war. How do we do that? How do we watch that, Gil? How do we ensure that we're not always fighting back, but rather the media uh, uh, outlets, agencies themselves, adopt a more stringent and more critical approach before they publish any type of libel and any type of lie against Israel. All right. Well, uh, first of all, thank you so much, Maurice. And uh, I hope you feel a little better there. And uh, I appreciate the invitation to speak to uh, such a distinguished audience over here for the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, an institution that I've always been impressed with during my quarter century recovering politics for the Jerusalem Post, and uh, uh, even more so now uh, when we're on the same team 
in fighting against Israel's enemies. And um, I, I made that shift because that fight is so important. Um, and I got an opportunity to lead it as the executive director of Honest Reporting uh, to lead the fight for Israel on the media battlefield, uh, which in Honest Reporting's more than 20 years of history has been the mainstream media, the New York Times and CNN, etc. And when I took over, I expanded it to be also social media and our CEO, Jackie Alexander, has taken that to a, a new level. So I believe that there are three battles going on for Israel's existence right now. One on the military battlefield where Israel is supposed to have an advantage. One on North American college campuses where we're at a great disadvantage. And one on the media battlefield, which is the fairest fight, an uphill battle, but one we can all make an impact on. And it's also the key to winning the other two. Uh, the fray, the uh, quote, winning on the media battlefield is the key to winning on the military battlefield, was originally said uh, not by a Zionist, but by Osama bin Laden. Uh, but uh, I guess he's gotten more popular recently. And uh, I, that's the only thing we can agree on, uh, me and Osama. Uh, Alava not shalom. And uh, the army has told me it too, uh, that um, we uh, give more time for the army to accomplish its goals by doing what we do in, in gaining deterrence for Israel on that media battlefield. Now, I would argue that on these three battlefields, um, it's the only one that's going well so far in this war. The military battlefield, you've had plenty of uh, generals and former generals address this distinguished forum. And uh, I don't think anyone can claim that the war is accomplishing it, its goals. Uh, the the uh, We have not killed uh, any Hamas terrorists that any of us could have heard of before. And uh, how many hostages have we freed? Negative two, right? We freed one and we killed three. Um, so, uh, and the, the ones that we had to release terrorists from prison uh, don't count in, in that mathematical equation. Um, so uh, please God, uh, we should have more uh, killing terrorists and, and freeing hostages uh, but unfortunately, it's been the other way too much. And until it becomes in the right way, uh, which uh, should happen right now, um, we can't call this a military victory yet. Obviously, on college campuses uh, where the young people are, are terrified to identify as being Jewish, we can't call that a victory either. Uh, I wrote an article about the situation on college campuses for Friday's Jerusalem Post. I encourage you to read uh, tomorrow, um, but giving the benefit of the doubt, I'll call it an incomplete and say that it is still possible for October 7th to be the turning point that it needs to be for young people in America to understand what Israel is going through. If we educate properly and get our messages out, uh, it's going to be hard, but it can still be done. Um, but so neither one of those battlefields were close to winning. The media battlefield, I think that what's gone on in this war is, is astounding. Um, throughout the war, there have been victories. And, and before I give credit to Honest Reporting, I need to give credit to the IDF. Uh, Daniel Hagari, I met with him a couple months before the war began. And I was very impressed because I served in Dover Sahal. I know the history of uh, the way they allocate their resources, 99% to the Hebrew uh, Dover Sahal, whose main goal is helping the generals enter politics later on, and 1% to uh, the English, French, Spanish, Arabic uh, spokesman's unit that is so important in helping the military be able to accomplish its goals. And, and listening to Daniel Akari, I was like, wow, he's the first IDF spokesman to get it. Uh, and how that we're the most important part. And um, 
he's proven it throughout this war and the constant English briefings that are unprecedented. Uh, for the man in charge uh, of the spokesman's unit of the army and the closest person to the chief of staff of the army uh, in putting out uh, constant graphics and videos for the journalists, taking them on the tours, what they've done with that uh, nightmarish video and making sure to maximize its impact with the journalists and the diplomats and the influencers and the world leaders. Um, he's handled it very, very smartly. And um, we have to compare it to what's happened in the past. In uh, the war in May of 2021 in Gaza, we took down a tower that was called the Associated Press and Al Jazeera Tower. Of course, gave an hour for everyone to leave as we do, but that also gave time for it to be filmed around the world um, and Israel to look terrible. In uh, that incident, the spokesman of the army did not let the English department say that this was the cyber tower of Hamas that was jamming Iron Dome and taking that tower down saved a lot of lives. Now, when you had the attack on Allah, the the uh, reports that Israel had killed 500 people uh, attacking Al Ali Hospital with the international media reporting uh, what the Hamas health department was telling them as if it was gospel from Jesus, uh, it did damage but I think it did more damage to the media because within four hours, the IDF had already provided proof that we didn't do it. Solid proof that it was an Islamic Jihad errant rocket from the uh, fire from the cemetery next door to the hospital and that hit the parking lot, killing uh, 20, 30 people. That's it. Um, you know, you can say four hours is way too long. It has to be four seconds. But uh, it, you should be amazed that it didn't take four months because that's what's happened in the past and, and lessons are being learned. Um, also, uh, there were the things that uh, Honest Reporting did or already on uh, October the uh, 11th, uh, Honest Reporting already got the main guy covering the war from the Associated Press, uh, Isam Adwan, fired uh, for... Uh, because we discovered on on his social media accounts, he had said that there has to be a, a, a Palestinian revolt. Uh, he wrote this in English months before the war, that Israelis are Nazis and uh, have to be destroyed. Um, that was already four days into the war. Uh, the Al-Ali hospital hoax was 10 days into the war. Um, two days after that, uh, we got the New York Times Nazi fired. Uh, the New York Times, uh, unfortunately, has had a history of employing Hitler uh, praisers on social media. And a year ago, we got them fired. And then they rehired one of them. And uh, after we called attention to that, and, and Gilad Erdan and others did around the world, uh, his byline has not been seen, uh, Suleiman Hiji, since then. Um, and then there was our scoop uh, with the photographers uh, that we questioned why they knew to cross that border from Gaza into Israel so early that day, how they got there and why they didn't do anything to stop what was going on. And uh, that led to the firing of uh, Hassan Asliach, uh, someone very close to uh, the heads of Hamas, uh, to Yichis Sinwar, who should have never been hired by CNN or AP, but he was hired by both, and he'd still be working for both right now and providing information about this war to people around the world if it weren't for honest reporting. And the last example that I'm going to give <laughs> is the BBC. Because, you know, there are a lot of people, uh, I see British names here, uh, and the participants who have been following the BBC a lot closer than me uh, for decades. Uh, but everyone I've asked no one can ever remember the BBC apologizing twice in one day for anything. And they did uh, on November 15th. They apologized for saying that uh, the uh, IDF had gone into a hospital to target Arabic speakers and medical personnel, meaning everyone in the hospital, uh, when the press release actually said that the IDF had brought with them soldiers who were medical personnel and, and Arabic speakers in order to minimize the problems there. The BBC 
uh, an hour after the report came on and apologized, saying that it was beneath their normal standards. But hours later, they, in a different report, said that there were 10,000 people who attended a pro-Israel rally in Washington. Now, I personally know more than 10,000 people who attended that rally in Washington, but at least it's right. There were 10,000 people there. There were another 290,000, uh, but uh, they they had to apologize for that too. That's amazing. And so I consider that part of a victory because the pressure that there would be on Israel to end this war would happen from the media directly or indirectly pressuring the Biden administration and leaders around the world uh, to pressure Israel to end the war. And when the media looks this bad as they do in this war, that prevents there from being the pressure. If you would have asked me on October 6th, if it's possible that the Biden administration would allow Netanyahu to conduct a 70-day war in Gaza, no way, of course not. And it's happening. And that's one of the reasons why it's happening. And that's our segue, just briefly before I finish, uh, to the political battlefield that I also promised here with my other hat as the uh, political correspondent of the Jerusalem Post for a quarter century. Um, the moment this war ends, uh, we're going to go from uh, the focus, as it's been, on, on the tragedy of the beheaded babies back into the internal politics, and the focus is going to go back to beheading Bibi. That's what's going to happen. Um, you know, you had 40 weeks of protests, whatever it was before the war, and those protests are only going to be intensified by having the family members of 1,200 victims joining those protests, especially um, the ones who were uh, the soldiers, who a lot of them came from Netanyahu's political base, and people are very angry. Um, that's only going to make it more and more intense. Can protests of a million people every Saturday night bring Netanyahu down? The answer is no. There are 64 members of Knesset in Netanyahu's coalition. As long as they want to stay together, they will. Itamar ben Gvir, if he decides he wants to show Israelis that he's much more right-wing than the other people in the coalition, be the hero who uh, said not to do prisoner exchanges and, and uh, warned more than others did about the dangers of Hamas, that's what could bring Netanyahu down. Uh, but much more so than a million people protesting uh, every Saturday night for a month or two. A commission of inquiry could bring Netanyahu down as uh, they brought down Golda, but that's going to take time because how are you going to even find a retired judge to head such a commission when all the judges have been identified politically recently? Um, so uh, Netanyahu is going to still be around. He's not going to resign. I don't see a rebellion in Likud happening. I don't see courage inside the Likud uh, to overthrow him. And uh, so uh, the uh, we're going to go back from where we were on uh, uh, Simchat Torah that reminded us that we can't afford to fight anymore, as has happened throughout history, that our enemies have reminded us that we can't afford to fight. We're going to go back to Yom Kippur mode, uh, where uh, Jews fought each other physically in a public square in Tel Aviv about whether to have a mafitza. Um, any lessons about the importance for unity that happened in this war, the, the beautiful call, a plea by, by Yechiel Leiter, you know, was involved in JCPA in the past, when uh, from the funeral of his eldest son, uh, that if, if the people of Israel remain united, then uh, he didn't die in vain. That's a... a, a... Yeah, we're not going to remain united. And uh, so now we can... Uh, Go back to arguing over here, right? That's a segue out to, <laughs> to the questions that they're going to be here, right, Maurice? So, so on, on that front, Gil, uh, really, it's 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 a it's a very wide spectrum that you've opened up, and 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 I think they all need all of those subjects need to be discussed a little bit more. We'll leave, I, I, I with your permission, politics uh, um, to the end of it. I would uh, maybe a word on that at the end, but uh, um, going back, I, I think you're actually right. I think that. 
that one of the most important lessons that I see that the IDF has learned, uh, I think that there are a lot of successes on the battleground, but uh, but I think you're 100%. One of the, the, the most uh, uh, substantial and biggest jumps of the IDF as compared to all of the other previous wars is on uh, uh, um, is on the media front. This uh, uh, the reports being given every single day, uh, Hebrew, English, the, the 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 infographics that really flooding the media. What we'd seen in other uh, uh, military campaigns adopted by uh, Western armies suddenly, and and we just assumed that Israel had just decided never to do it, even though it had worked successfully. Suddenly now being implemented and with really tremendous precision, present tremendous uh, uh, um, um, accuracy, not running back and shooting at everything, saying, you know what, we need, even in the El Ahali uh, hospital incident, we need that time to do a thorough check, see what's going on. Um, when I uh, uh, heard that uh, uh, initial uh, um, report, I was actually doing a, a, a briefing at the time, um, not not uh, with, the, with this JCPA but briefing, but another JCPA briefing, and my immediate response to the question asked was, I do not believe that Israel would ever attack a hospital. I, I just don't believe that that would happen without prior, prior warning and without giving a, 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 a sufficient chance for uh, the, 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 the patients to be evacuated. And, but yet that, that steady hand on the wheel of Hagari, of the IDF spokesman in English, in Hebrew, in Arabic, it all really has seemed to come together um, in, in, in quite an impressive form. Where do you think that that change happened? Because, as you said, two years ago, it wasn't the same. Even a year ago, it wasn't the same. Now, it, 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 now it's, it seems like it's, it, 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 as they say in Hebrew, it's, a, it's heaven and earth different. There's a very nice profile that, that uh, my friend and former colleague, Lahav Harkov, wrote for Jewish Insider uh, about Daniel Hagari, about how he grew up in, in a, a theater because his mother was the head of the uh, box office at a theater. And um, he, uh, and he's got a, a brother in America. He's a, he's a worldly guy. And he, he uh, understood uh, the way that we're looked around the world is uh, what impacts the ability of the military to get anything done. You know, there's a reason why in my office, I have this hourglass because that's who we are in, in providing the uh, idea at the time to get it done. It, it's him and it's Hertzia Levy. You know, I don't know how long Hertzia Levy is going to be the chief of staff of the IDF. He's uh, apparently got a resignation letter ready to take effect the day after the war because of the uh, surprise of October 7th. And, and again, we talked about how there haven't been clear victories in this war, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, at least on this, the, the chief of staff gets it too. And I have to give credit to the English staff, to, to uh, Ken Rikus and Richard Heft and, and, and uh, Drone Spielman and Peter Lerner uh, um, that are doing amazing work too. Um, and uh, to my friend Elon Levy, uh, answering the questions of uh, the uh, journalists around the world. And uh, Netanyahu made a mistake. It has to be said that he did not appoint an English spokesman um, at all. He didn't have one. He fired Karen Hajioff, who worked for Lapid and Bennett, uh, right when he took over. And he didn't hire anyone until the day after the war began. And uh, the people that were hired after the war began have done amazing work, too. I think on that front, the, the, the different speakers from really from both the army the prime minister's office and also the, uh, uh, the, the 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 foreign office have really done a, a, a very a, 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 a top job um, responding to what were uh, um, clearly hostile uh, questions, hostile interviews over and over again. And you've had now have that group of particularly experienced uh, spokesmen who have been able to stand clearly, give over that message over and over and over again, and that really both led by uh, uh, Hagari, led by uh, um, uh, uh, the IDF. And I think that that's given very much too. of the perspective. Also putting in there uh, um, the, uh, even spokesman in Arabic. Uh, uh, Ella, uh, uh, I always get her name. 
Captain Captain Ella, we call her. Uh, yeah, uh, young young Israeli Arab woman, very impressive. Young young Israeli uh, 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 woman um, who's very very uh, uh, um, articulate, can explain in Arabic perfectly as to what's going on. Avichai Edri, um, who's the 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 spokes the IDF spokesman for uh, um, the Arab languages, and we've seen this being intertwined into really effectively into the policy and the operational plans of the army, both on the side of providing the army with um, uh, um, the, the, that background that it needs and the backup that it needs to explain what's gone on, and also as part of the team really moving forward, providing the uh, Gazan uh, population with instructions, where to go, how to go, in the language uh, um, that, 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 they, uh, uh, that they understand very clearly. Um, and that seems to have been very much more of a clear and concerted effort um that and 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 what i understood from you is that you believe that it's based on specifically daniel hagari's background what he specifically brought to the job even though he came from the navy seals he didn't come from a media background which they, is they haven't had anyone incredible. with a media background as the dovertal in hebrew uh, almost ever um it's just the way it goes that but it's important because the Dover Sahal is the person closest to the chief of staff of the army. Could you imagine, Maurice, how important it would be if they did the same thing in the police? The police uh, don't have anyone who understands the English media. For 10 years, M Mickey Rosenfeld was there, and then he wasn't replaced for two and a half years. Now they've got a young guy named Dean Elsdon who's excellent, but he's nowhere close to being uh, the way uh, the English spokesmen of the army are, two people away from the uh, head, from the boss. Um, you know, Richard Heft, as the English spokesman for the IDF, is close to Hagari, who's close, the best friend of the chief of staff of the army. And the police, there's nowhere near that that closeness. I think the, 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 there's a lot uh, in general to learn from the army. Um, on uh, 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 as to what's going on really as part of that 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 military operation and how it's being explained and how it's been carried out i think there's also a lot to learn as 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 i as uh, from from the other side i would i would somewhat disagree with you about the success on 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 on, on the battlefield i i agree that that some of the names that we've seen of the terrorists killed on 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 the glittering stars um please god as you said we'll we, we'll get there as well but I think the success of the IDF on on, on implementing battleground uh, um, operations in in what is probably one of the most difficult urban areas is something which I think will be very much studied, similar to uh, Arik Sharon's uh, Ariel Sharon's uh, move in in in, uh, in in the Yom Kippur War in 1973, cutting off the Egyptian armies. I think that some of the practices that have been carried out by the IDF on the ground um, as part of this urban warfare will be studied by foreign armies. Um, obviously, we won't get into that too much uh, um, because the, the, these operations are going on. But I think we're going to see a lot of uh, um, interesting things coming out of, of, of operational uh, directives, operational uh, uh, activities in these very, very highland, highly uh, uh, um, and, and, and dense urban populations, which is something which uh, um, the, really the world hasn't seen. Um, and, and here I'll give also that extra uh, um, uh, analysis as uh, the, the world is now claiming that there's been some 20,000 uh, Gazans killed. Um, I heard from a very, very senior um, Israeli uh, uh, source uh, um, just uh, two days ago that the IDF estimates that it's killed over 9,000 soldiers, uh, uh, terrorists on the other side. Um, and, and we're talking about a massive force. And and when these numbers actually prove to be, um, I think, accurate, then we'll see that this is unprecedented um, in Israel's, in the IDF's war against terrorists as compared to other battlegrounds. We've discussed it previously uh, um, on, on this uh, briefing. Um, the JCPA actually reached a... A, a paper just a few months ago comparing Israel's anti-terror uh, activities to those of other armies, um, and 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 there we've we in showed terms of that civilian, civilian casualties. In terms of civilian casualties, when you when you look at Iraq, the first six years of Iraq, two thousand and four through two thousand and nine, 
American army uh, document saying that 109,000 people were killed. Excuse me, of them, 66,000 were civilians. Um, when you talk about other uh, operations, like everyone knows the the, the, the film uh, 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 Black Hawk Down, um, that's a that's a very very specific incident in Mogadishu uh, um, in October uh, uh, 1993, um, where is uh, American forces were uh, uh, trapped in a gunfire with uh, uh, terrorists uh, um, in 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 Mogadishu, and and as a result of the battle, some they, they say that there were over a thousand. Some say up to 1,500 people killed, of whom 150 odd were were terrorists. That means that the proportion of civilians to combatants was was was, was off the charts. Um, and I think Israel's going to be have, be able to show that, despite what's being said uh, um, uh, by President Biden, that our activities have been unprecedented in the precautions that we've taken. Um, Against the uh, um, against the terrorists and and in this uh, drive to uh, um, to to defend lives. Now that I have to say brings us on to directly to the the the, the question. You know, despite those numbers, despite that reality, despite that Israel, the fact that Israel clearly is with the number of attacks we've carried out, um, clearly is being so cautious. The media is not reflecting that. The media is. It seems to be. It doesn't matter what Israel can do. We're damned if we do. We're damned if we don't. And 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 the the successes in correcting is just means that they were biased in the first place. How do we get over that? How do we persuade them to to drop that? It's it's clearly an anti-Semitic bias. Is there any way to get over that? We have to be a watchdog. We being all of us in uh, monitoring the media because. Uh, uh, on October 7th and 8th, we got very positive coverage around the world. Uh, people saw uh, the uh, videos uh, and the pictures that came out uh, on the front page of the papers the following day. You had Noah Argamani, who unfortunately is still in Gaza, uh, uh, a picture of her being dragged away saying, don't kill me. Um, and uh, the further we get from October 7th, um, the more the media doesn't even include the cause of the war in their reports. They're focusing on what's going on right now. And, and uh, uh, right now, there are more Arabs than Jews that are dying. And uh, they make it that simplistic. And uh, that's why it's so important that we constantly remind uh, that this is a war between uh, terrorists and Jewish, Christian, and Muslim Israelis. You know, we've got plenty of examples of, of Arabs being targeted in this war, Arabs fighting for Israel in this war, Arabs being hostages in this war. Those messages have to keep on getting out. Uh, there was a, a study uh, by uh, Vibe Israel, an organization that does branding, and uh, they found out that the most effective messaging is to, uh, right now anyway, is to be highlighting that the Hamas hurt the Palestinian people while Israel is helping the Palestinian people. Um, and uh, th that right after they did that study, you saw the idea of talking about how much supplies, how many trucks are getting into Gaza every single day, how there's not a humanitarian crisis, how it's the Hamas that are on the trucks as they come in and uh, taking them away for their terrorists. Uh, we need to make sure that those messages get out and anyone who sees incorrect reporting around the world, please write action at honestreporting.com so we'll know about it and we can lead the fight. Uh, go to honestreporting.com slash take action where we're constantly feeding more things that, that you can do in helping win that fight on the media battlefield. And thank you to all of you who've been doing your part uh, on social media. So for, for, for that, Gil, uh, um... I, I just want to un understand a little bit more of of also what came out. You mentioned it before the the expose the uh, um, of the of the the photographers joining the terrorists. Now th this is really uh, uh, also I think unprecedented that you have journalists who clearly had advance warning and advance information of a imminent uh, uh, um, genocidal attack and 
and and yet they 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 went along they played along they were they were almost embedded in 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 the terrorist forces how has the journalistic world responded to that so first of all it's important to say we merely ask questions about how they were there so early uh we didn't say that they were embedded and we didn't say that they were told in advance but they were there quite early. Uh, the, just the incidents that they photographed themselves uh, within the kibbutzim and, and uh, the IDF tank that was burned. And the people who went over that border were Hamas terrorists or people who came to uh, rape and kidnap and murder. Um, and people who were told if you bring back Jews into Gaza, they'll get a, a large amount of money from Hamas, which by the way, they weren't. Um, and so the photographers that went over that border, that's who they're going over with. And that is illegitimate. And it led to the discovery of how close Hassan Asliach was with Yichia Sinwar and uh, the videos that have come out of him with the guy in the grenade and the motorcycle and everything. Um, and uh, that is uh, totally unacceptable. Um, and uh, we have to hold the media accountable for hiring these people, for hiring people who they know uh, did that on that day. Uh, the AP and, and Reuters and the New York Times uh, and CNN hired people who had done this on that day. Um, and uh, we have to remember that it, we're journalists, but we're also human beings. And uh, there were Israeli journalists who saved lives that day. Uh, Rami Shani, uh, the Galei Sahal reporter in the South, uh, who's uh, in his 60s, he uh, found his way to uh, the Nova Dance Festival. And instead of going there and reporting on what's going on there, he saved lives. And uh, that's who we journalists uh, need to be. So so I apologize for, for, for what may seem like a rude question. Um, <laughs> So uh, um, explain, if there is such a thing, explain to me as a, a little bit about journalistic ethics. Like, I, 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 that's why I say it, it's almost a rude question. Um, when, if we weren't talking about journalists who were so close to Yechia Sinwar, who, got in, who, who merely got information about the fact that there was about to be this massacre, that, were, that, that heard about it on the... And 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 rushed to the scene to 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 take pictures of of the women being raped and uh, uh, and the babies being beheaded. Do you think that that is legitimate journalistic activities, or is there a red line, even of even for journalists? Yeah, I see both sides as uh, someone who worked in journalism and now is a watchdog. Uh, targeting the journalists um, because uh, I'm glad these pictures came out. I, I'm glad the world saw what happened on that day. Uh, but I still would have wished that they would have held themselves to higher standard in being human beings before being the uh, nationalists for their people and, and before being uh, the, the activist journalists that they are. I, I, what you when you talk about knowing before, okay? So we got this tip that um, the uh, BBC, which uh, used to have a larger bureau in uh, the technological park in uh, Malha, um, they now part of their office is um, the office of a high tech company. That uh, in mid September they told the high tech company to clear out their bomb shelter by October sixth. And, and okay, yeah, so your eyebrows raised and hey, the levy style what? there, and there, Maurice. And uh, so, uh, of course, that's, we have to that's look like into a this. new scoop. But it looks, it sounded like it, right? So, uh, I called up a, a friend who works there, and uh, it, it is true that that letter went out, but um, he said, Do you think if I could have saved 12,000 lives, I, I would have chosen to be uh, a journalist first? And I said, of course not. And he said, and if you think there are people in the BBC Bureau who would have made the other decision? And he said, there probably are. He said, then why was our Bureau Chief on the Lebanese border that night? 
don't you think he would have been in the South? Um, so uh, that was the proof that they didn't know in advance. But, you know, um, all these uh, journalistic red lines that are constantly being questioned. And then, but uh, I did take a journalism ethics class at, at Northwestern, and I, I learned a lot. But my professor was cheating on his wife with one of the students in the class. And uh, I, I, that kind of undermined anything he was teaching me. What what it, what it seems uh, uh, to be, and uh, unfortunately, uh, um, the, the the picture, and and it's one of the comments that we've uh, received from 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 our audience, from from Dennis Karp, um, that Israel seems only to be respected when when it's a victim. You you alluded to it on the on the seventh and the eighth. There were some pictures of and some reports that were positive of the hideous nature of 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 the attack and. And 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 the attack on the on on the supernova music festival, but it very very quickly changed um, uh, um, to Israel being again the aggressor and and completely forgetting how this war started. It didn't Israel didn't start it. Uh, it was started by Hamas who who, who broke a, a, a ceasefire and and murdered babies, women, children, elderly. Um, there were I, I just uh, saw some statistics today that there were. Uh, um, uh, um, I just missed it for a second. Um, of the uh, of the people killed, um, just to give a, 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 an idea, there were um, one second. I completely lost it. But there were eighteen, uh, uh, um, as you said, uh, um, Bedouin citizens, Arab Muslims, um, who were killed as part of uh, uh, um, the massacre and. Uh, and so, uh, subsequently, from rockets that have been fired, thirty-seven minors um, that, that that were murdered, twenty-five people over the age of eighty were murdered. That it can't be that we only get any type of credit as as victims when 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 there are dead Jews, um, and 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 not dead soldiers even, just dead civilians. That's what you seem to be suggesting is the only time that we're actually going to get any credit. Fortunately, that's the way it works with young people nowadays. Underdogs are the aggressor. Makes uh, excuse me, the, the underdogs are, are one side, and the aggressor is the other side, and um, that has been hurting Israel for decades in in the battle for public opinion. Um, I, I remember one time I, I uh, was about to uh, give a political briefing to students at NYU, and a few days before um, the the head of the Israel club said to me, uh, we'd love to have your political briefing, but we're going through such a hard time right now. Do you mind changing the subject to how to help us with the hard time we're going through on this campus? And that was so sad, but I did it. And um, I said, you know, Pittsburgh just happened uh, in the Tree of Life synagogue uh, a couple weeks ago. You need to embrace your victimhood. The Jews are the most discriminated against minority in the world and especially in America. And uh, you need to be taking advantage of that terrorist attack uh, to uh, remind people um, who the Jews are, that we're not this privileged people that uh, in uh, the uh, rules of intersectionality uh, are, are uh, the uh, people who uh, get criticized and uh, the Palestinians aren't this uh, minor minority that's brown that needs to be embraced. Um, and right now, it's Qatar that controls the colleges, you know, giving huge amounts of money to dozens of American universities. All, all the anti-Semitic claims uh, uh, against the Jews is true of Qatar. The supporters of the uh, of the uh, pro pro Palestinian movements on the college campuses. We need to be getting these messages out. And, and 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 it's not only that. It's uh, um, as uh, uh, the JCPA uh, report published uh, uh, actually today um, from my colleague uh, Lenny Ben David um, discussing and 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 exposing the involvement of uh, the wife of the uh, of the Sheikh of Qatar uh, actually in of the leader of Qatar actually in that not only in the the the, the student movements but also in the the BDS movement um, really substantial involvement of Qatar in everything anti-Israel. Um, the fact that they're funding Hamas, the fact that they they really are part of that Muslim Brotherhood, which is uh, um, 
very much a source of of, of tremendous evil. One last question from from one of our our, 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 our audience, Gil, from Lee's cause. And uh, um, how and 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 I experienced this personally. Um, a few days after the the bombing of the El Ali Hospital, um, I was on an interview for British TV, um, and and someone uh, a phone. There was a phone in discussion. We were answering as part of the panel. And someone phoned in and said, well, how do you explain the fact that, that Israel bombed the El Ali hospital and killed 500 people? Now, we know that this is debunked. We know that this is a lie. We know that this is a libel. Everybody knows that it's true, but most people will see the initial report. They won't necessarily see the rollback because the press isn't that honest, uh, um, with all due respects, and and retractions are usually on uh, on the 17th page in, uh, in, 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 in font 8. Um, as opposed to the title, which was on the front page in uh, in Font 75, um, or on CNN, where it was a, a massive event for hours and hours, and then they'll have one uh, uh, um, one presenter saying, "Well, we sort of messed up there." How do we prevent these debunked stories from coming up over and over and over again? Well, you need to be holding the media accountable. They're still saying it. Yeah, <laughs> they're still saying this lie. And uh, I was in New Orleans when it happened, and the phrase that I learned there was, you can't put the toothpaste back into the tube. Uh, the, the, the damage is done. And it led to protests uh, around the world, uh, including in uh, Tulane University, seen as the safest university in America for a Jew to go to. Violent uh, protest there. Um, so uh, it's terrible, but we have to every time uh, somebody reports it incorrectly, um, hold them accountable, get it fixed immediately. What, what you say said a minute ago, Maurice, about the corrections go on page 18, um, that is the way it happens in print, but the print journalism has less of an impact than it used to have. You know, we can get things changed on social media uh, um, within seconds. You know, We get alerts when new reports come out there and we have our relationships at Honest Reporting with the media and we can get them behind the scenes to uh, fix things when they say things that are incorrect and uh, hopefully before people really see it online. And uh, that's uh, something more important than ever. And that's why we rely with the small staff that we have here, three writers. On, uh, we rely on people like you around the world who are vigilant and watching the media uh, to tell us. Uh, make sure you subscribe to when we put out on us, reporting.com slash subscribe. Subscribe your children and grandchildren. You don't have to ask their permission. Just put their <laughs> put their email address over there. Yeah, there's all types uh, of rules and, about that in Europe, I fear. And, and uh, tell them to be following us on social media because that's where the impact is being made. In 2022, we had only 4 million people sharing our content. We've had close to 90 million since October 7th. That's amazing. It's a amazing work that's being done. Um, we have a, a final, uh, just a question, not for you, Gil, but from Anna Livingston about uh, um, the the influence of, of of students for justice in Palestine and all of those groups. Um, Alan, uh, in, in answer to your question, really, that's a, that's an entirely different subject that needs to be discussed. It is something which is being led uh, um, by the JCPA, by our president Dan Dyker, who's actually been in America this week. And, and last week as well, uh, um, updating the research that was already uh, um, uh, uh, available and, and really trying to inform as many people as possible. Go on to our site, jcpa.org, and you'll see that there, there are the most updated reports literally from uh, uh, the last few days. Um, Gil, unfortunately, our time has run out. Um, th thankfully, saved by the gong that we don't have to get into the politics. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, um, but, uh, but I... Uh, uh, I, I I fear that that's possibly what people wanted to hear was more about what's going to happen with Netanyahu at the end. Uh, um, but uh, I said uh, it. unfortunately, you can rewind. Our, 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 time, our time is limited. Um, as regards the army personnel, I, I, I won't get into the political side. As regards the army personnel, I would say that, uh, again, as, as, as an ex-officer in the army, uh, um, uh, I, I, I believe that every single one of the army personnel that is responsible and that was responsible for the October 7 uh, uh, um, uh, uh, failure um, will not, no one will wait for them to be thrown out. No one will need to push them out. I believe that they are all uh, uh, principled and moral and, and, and really tremendously 
people with high values and and they will all, as you said, Herzia Levy, um, potentially a great Ramat Kal, will already have his uh, 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 resignation letter uh, ready. So uh, I believe uh, uh, will many others. And uh, that's the way that the, the, the IDF works, taking responsibility not only for the successes, but also for the failures. And, and here there was uh, a, a tremendous failure. Um, the IDF, I believe the Shabak will be the same, uh, um, uh, but we'll have to wait and see as regards everyone else. Gil, uh, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, thank you uh, to our audience for joining us again. Um, we will be back on Sunday. No program tomorrow, no briefing tomorrow. Um, early Shabbat in Israel. Um, so we will see you again at four o'clock Israel time on Sunday. In the meantime, keep safe, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Gil, thank you for joining us.